بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا حول ولا قوه الا بالله العظيم Brother Mustafa Briggs, Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. How are you doing? I'm good, man. Tired, but good. So, your first <laughs> time in the Bay Area? First time, yeah, alhamdulillah. My wife is from SoCal. I think you guys call it SoCal. Yeah, we do. <laughs> so, she's from LA. So, I've been to that side, but this was my first time in the Bay. And um, it's been an amazing time, man. Amazing five days, alhamdulillah. MashaAllah. Um, I want to go back. Just to the beginning, what's your story, man? What's your spiritual journey? My spiritual journey, oh God, that's a long one. Um, to summarize it, uh, in order to understand where I am now, you have to understand like my family context. So my father is Nigerian. Uh, he's from a place called Akwaibom in Nigeria. He's Catholic. Um, he came to England to study in the 90s, early 90s. His older brother owned like an airline and they had 11 siblings so his older brother kind of sponsored his younger brothers to go out and study mm. so my dad was one of them he went to italy first and then he went to the uk where he met my mom my mom was born in the uk she's gambian and sierra leonean origin so her, her family her father's sierra leonean her mother's gambian and um she was born in the uk she grew up in gambia and then she came back to the uk to study in her late teens as well she went to boarding school out there and then she just stayed Mm. So my parents met, my mother's Christian, my father's Christian as well. Um, but my mom comes from a 90% Muslim country. So she grew up around Muslims. I have Muslim relatives, Muslim cousins, distant cousins, etc. cetera. Um, growing up in that environment, my dad went back to Nigeria when I was a kid. So I never actually physically met my dad until I was 20. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I grew up just with my mom and my grandma. And um, my grandma used to take me back to Gambia regularly. And so like going to Gambia, I was exposed to Islam there mm. because it's a majority Muslim country. And, you know, their majority, most of them are Sufi as well. So it's like you walk in the street and you see the gatherings, you see Qasida recitations, you hear the mosque playing the Quran, you know, Khalil Husseini in between Salah. You see people praying on the street on Fridays. And so I was very curious as a kid as to like, what is this religion that they're practicing and why are we not practicing it? Hmm. So that led me to kind of go into my family history. And um, my mother's family, they're from an ethnic group called the Creole. In Gambia, they're called Aku. In Senegal, in Sierra Leone, they're called Creole. And Creole people are the descendants of liberated African slaves who returned to Africa after the slave trade ended from America, from the Caribbean, or they were like on slave ships being taken to America and the Caribbean and then they were freed by British um, anti-slavery patrols. And so they all resettled in Sierra Leone in Freetown. That's why the capital is called Freetown because there was four free people. And from there, they traveled out into Gambia and other places and back into Nigeria to trade. So because of that, my family, like my Gambian family, they all have English surnames. So like Briggs is is a Welsh surname. My grandma's surname is Roberts, Williams, Jones, and they all go to church and they all wear suits. And we don't have a native language. We have a language that's a dialect of English. It's similar to like Patois in Jamaica or the Gullah Geechee language in, you know, in Georgia. So <clears throat> discovering the fact that my family were only Christian because of slavery and colonization and the area where we live, we were originally African and uh, Muslim and studying the history of like the Mali Empire, Songhai, the spread of Islam in West Africa. I just kind of made up my mind as a kid. And then reading like Ahmed Dida, watching YouTube videos, comparing Christianity with Islam, I was like, Islam makes the most sense. And according to the demographic of where I come from, I should be Muslim anyway. So I made the decision to like, when I grow up, I'm going to become Muslim. And then, so that was around the age of, I don't know, like seven, eight. Wow. <laughs> yeah. But I said, I'm going to wait till I'm older to actually become Muslim. And um, I went back to Gambia around the age of like 12. And I noticed, so by that time, I already knew about Islam. I had already read all the books in my local library. I had already like taught myself Fatiha. I already kind of knew. And in my heart, I was like, yeah, I'm Muslim. I'm just going to wait till I'm 18. So my parents can't tell me what to do and become Muslim. But then I kept on seeing pictures of this, like these old men and they were on everywhere, like 
taxis, shops, buildings, everywhere you go, there's these pictures of these old men in flowing robes with beards. And there's one particular picture that stood out for me. And it was a man, picture of a man who I later knew to be Sheikh Ibrahim Nyas, um, who's like, you know, Senegalese scholar, one of the most influential, if not the most influential African Muslim scholar in the past hundred years. And um, I kept on asking questions about him. His picture really intrigued me. And the fact that they wrote Sheikh al-Islam on the picture. And I'm like, I didn't know we had a Sheikh al-Islam out here <laughs> in Gambia or in Senegal or wherever. So I asked my grandma about him. He said, yeah, he's Senegalese. I went back to England. I did research on um, on the internet until I came across the contact of his grandson, Sheikh Hassan Sise. And Sheikh Hassan Sise, you know, gave me his phone number. He gave, I was emailing him. And he put me in contact with his younger brother, Sheikh Mahi Sise, who was coming to England in 2007 so that I could visit him. And he said in the message, um, go and visit my younger brother and I'm praying and making dua that you become Muslim. So when I went to see Sheikh Mahi, that's exactly what happened. I took Shahada with him. He gave me the name Muhammad al-Mustafa. And then I continued to keep in contact with uh, Sheikh Hassan Sise. Uh, I gave bayah to him, took the Tijani Tariqa from him. And so at the age of 13, I was like, new Muslim, New practicing Sufi had my had my five salah to do on my weird morning and evening, and I've just been yeah I've been connected ever since. Alhamdulillah. That's an origin story that I've never heard before. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's, it's a bit crazy. Yeah, Alhamdulillah. It's a very unique path. So you came straight into this particular Tijani Sufi tariqa. Yeah, that was your Islam from day one. That was yeah, that was my Islam from day one. Obviously, going to school. Um, I used to go to the prayer room. So like when I took Shahad, uh, I was in what we call year nine. I don't know what you would call it here. Like middle school? Ninth grade, maybe? Ninth grade, yeah, yeah, yeah. Was okay, like yeah. high school? Just before high school. Oh, yeah, uh, middle school. Yeah, so I was in middle school and we had like a prayer room in school. So, you know, everyone was there. We had like Salafis there. We had Shias there. And so I used to go to the prayer room before I took Shahada. Every Friday I'll be there. I used to chill with them at lunchtime sometimes and talk to them, ask them questions. So I knew I had a I had a really good overview of Islam. Like I knew about Sunni Islam, I knew about Shia Islam, I knew about the different tariqas. Studying African history, I knew like the Qadiriya because they were popular in Nigeria. I knew about the Shadiliya because they were popular in Morocco. Um, and yeah, but the Tijaniya was the one that kind of got me. <laughs> yeah. Tell me what it was like coming into this particular Sufi path of Islam and then going back and seeing everything else. It kind of made me very content with what I had because I felt like the Islam that I received through the shuyukh was very spiritual. It was very tolerant. There was a huge emphasis on understanding Allah, knowing Allah, having an intimate relationship with Allah, which speaks to your spirit, but also being grounded in knowledge, being grounded in the tradition, knowing the Quran. Like when I was 15, one of the grand, um, the grandsons of Sheikh Ibrahim that lived in London, he was like, can you read the Quran? I was like, no, he's like, I, you're 15. He's like, by our age, we've memorized the Quran. You need to start studying. So, so I went and his wife was actually the one that taught me how to read and write Arabic how to, you know, memorize the Qur'an. I started memorizing the Qur'an in their house. The tariqas, they're very um, qasida oriented, like the shiuch write loads of qasidas, poetry and praise of the Prophet Sallallahu And that's the center of all the gatherings. Like anytime they meet up, they recite qasaid and you see people crying and people, you know, going into all these kind of different states. And you're like, okay, I want to know what he's saying in these poems that's moving these people like that. So that led me to start studying the Arabic language at the age of 16 or 17. Um, so, you know, I kind of saw, and because of the emphasis that the, sh like, it's different practicing Islam and understanding Islam from pamphlets and having like living examples of the Sunnah to visit and to see and to sit with and to benefit from. So it's like, you'll see the shuyukh whenever they come to the UK, you know, there'll be like a hundred people trying to see them and they're giving lectures and they're, you know providing you an example of how it must have been when the Prophet ﷺ was with his Sahaba. You can see that in real life with the shuyukh and the way things are. So that kind of gave me a context and a depth to my Islam that I knew that my friends didn't have. Mm -hmm. Because it's just like going to the masjid and there's some uncles there and they give you a pamphlet and, you know, 
you kind of have to figure things out for yourself. Whereas when you have that community and true of that level, like people who have memorized the Quran in their early teens, people who've studied in, you know, with their fathers in Senegal and then gone off to study in Mauritania and Egypt and like, it, I didn't really start to appreciate it until I was in my like, I would say late teens, early twenties. And I would just say things or I would talk to people and they'd be like, wow, I never thought of it like that. Or wow, I never understood things like that. And I'm like, that's kind of standard. I thought that was what everybody was on, but clearly it's not. But Alhamdulillah, it's been a blessing. It's been a blessing. Alhamdulillah. So I'm fascinated by your story now because, and I didn't know this before we had this conversation. Oh, okay. <laughs> but, um, but, uh, cause I, I grew up in a, in New Jersey in a community that was very, um, influenced probably by, you could say the Ikhwan mm. uh, and it's, um, sort of interpretation of things, which is very practical, pragmatic and, and political, and I guess. political, not very theologically deep, not very philosophically deep, mm. um, more of a reactionary position mm. and definitely no inner inward spirituality. Mm. So that never really spoke to me growing up. And then uh, I, I, I went on this crazy wayward path. I was, you know, uh, I was in a Muslim punk band called the Kaminas. Oh, wow. Uh, I don't know if you ever saw that thing called Taqwa Core. Muslim yeah, yeah, punk. yeah. I heard about that. Yeah. yeah, I was a part of that. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Mashallah, that's lit, man. Yeah. So then I was on this, I got on this journey, right? And uh, what is fascinating that you just started there. Yeah. And, and for me, I had, took this life of, searching and searching and searching and then coming to this and being like this is part of the religion and now i ended up going to zaytuna college i finished that alhamdulillah and um, the four-year program the four-year program yeah so i wanted a perspective on what is religion Mm. and what is what is islam all about in our time you know and i felt like you know, when you go abroad and you become a student of knowledge, you come back, you have to translate it mm-hmm. to your context. Yeah, definitely. Right? right? And right now you're in Al-Azhar, right? Yeah. And uh, what's that like? What's that like being amongst the, the that, that strain of traditional study? I enjoy it. I enjoy it a lot. And I feel like it's very beneficial. One of my biggest takeaways from this whole trip coming to the Bay Area, because for us in the West, especially in the UK, um, whoever's not Salafi, we're we're always influenced by everything that's happening here. So like we grew up watching videos of Talif, Mm. videos of Imam Zaid and Sheikh Hamza and all of the amazing stuff that's going on here. We grew up hearing about Zaytuna and like anytime a Zaytuna book came out, we're always there, you know, queuing up to buy it. I remember one of the first books I got as a Muslim in my early years of Islam was um, Agenda to Change Our Condition. Yeah, classic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and um, Purification of the Heart as well. Yeah. But, uh, because I met actually the sheikh that gave Sheikh Hamza Ijazah for that, because he's a murid of my sheikh hmm. in Mauritania. His name is uh, Sheikh um, uh, Wul Ahmed Al Khadim, Sheikh Mohammed Hassan Wul Ahmed Al Khadim. He has a village called Taysir. So his, um, his, his sons and grandsons, they're always in Senegal. Um, and yeah, so those that that was like the Islam we grew up on. That was the alternative Islam to the pa- the Salafi pamphlet Islam yeah. that was being spread around, and the Ikhwani inspired political Islam. We have like Hizb Tahrir and all those other people, um, but like everyone that was kind of spiritually inclined or Sufi inclined, Zaytuna was the reference, Lighthouse Mosque was the reference, Talif was the reference, and so like to come here, it's been surreal because like Juma, I led Juma at. Uh, at Lighthouse Mosque and I, you know, did a dhikr there, I taught my class there. Sunday, I spoke at the Maulid at Talif and it was like going from seeing it from far to being in the middle of it was amazing, alhamdulillah. And the biggest lesson I took away from it was I was talking to Sidi uh, Mahdi Amin Mm -hmm. and he was saying that the whole kind of philosophy that they have was being rooted and relevant. So ta'asil or tawseel, like, having that connection to the tradition, but then also making it palatable for the time. And that's a tradition that I've seen all of the shuyukh do. And so it's kind of, it's funny when we as students of knowledge 
we look at the shuyukh, so we'll read like Jalaluddin Suyuti books from, I don't know, he's from the 14th century, or read all of these books of ancient Sufis or like all these Tasawwuf books from the 16th century, etc. And we don't realize or we fail to think about the fact that what they were doing was trying to take a spiritual reality that existed in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu and make it relevant to the people of their time. And not only were they doing that, but they were also dealing with social issues. So like Jalaluddin Suyuti wrote his book on anti-blackness. So did Ibn Jawzi, all of these people. And so what we tend to do, I think, is the error that we fall into is that instead of us studying the knowledge to make it relevant for our time, we kind of try and copy and paste the 14th century into the 21st century, hmm. which doesn't really work. Um, but what you guys have done in the Bay Area was actually take that tradition and then try and make it relevant for people in our day and age. And that's inspired a whole generation of people like how you mentioned earlier with the Baraka Boys on our podcast. It was the exact same thing because we're all connected to our shiur in Senegal, in Mauritania. And we see the way they do things in their communities and we see the spiritual knowledge and the light and, you know, the tradition that they have. But we're inner city kids from London or Birmingham or Manchester or Leicester. And we have what we have there. But then how do we get what we take from there and share it with the people where we are? We had to contextualize it. So like the Barack Boys podcast was um, an example of that and just the whole movement in general and what we did. And the whole reason why I'm here is just because the podcast and our activities kind of caught the attention of professors in Harvard. And there's one professor in particular, Usman Khan, who's the Al-Walid bin Talal um, professor of Islamic studies at Harvard. And he invited us to take part in a conference at Harvard just because he was impressed with like the work we were doing and seeing Islam in a context like that. And so the title of our panel session was Young Muslims, no, asserting identity and expressing spirituality, young Muslims in the West. Mm. And we just had to talk about how we do that as a collective because each of us kind of have different activities that we do. So like we have, for example, Khalid Siddiq and his brother Omar and Faisal Salah, who are all amazing musicians and they have their spiritual grounding in the Islamic tradition, but they make modern music that people kind of see and connect with and receive those messages through this modern music. Then like we have my friend Fahad, who me and him started an initiative called The Cave, which is basically similar to Ta'alif in Birmingham. And it was like a third space where people can come. We have shuyukh that teach classes, but we also bring poets. We have workshops. We have all different kind of activities for the community. And Mamadou Tal, he started, um, he's, he's a distant relative of mine, actually, and my best friend. And he's studying at Azhar as well, but he's also started like this media production company called Muslim Millennials. Mm -hmm. That's kind of about documenting the Muslim millennial experience. And um, yeah, so everyone's kind of doing that. So it's the same thought process of taking what we have and making it relevant to where we are. Let's talk about how the internet plays into all of this, because you guys got got together on whatsapp and on instagram how do you all meet each other and then how did this build up into this thing because baraka boys podcast has like fifty thousand views on the youtube channel and then you have you know your instagram which is over ten thousand. yeah um yeah it was literally all um through the internet like the internet this age is the internet age and i just came off the phone with like my shake son and he was saying the same thing he's saying that the elders have have escorted us to where we are and we have to continue the mission. He said, but we, this generation, we have the technology in our hands and we understand it. So we're the only ones that can do for ourselves what we need, what needs to be done. And that's exactly what it is. It's like, we all kind of got together. We all had social media profiles. We all had Instagrams. Me, Fahad and Mamadou were already friends. And then Omar and his brother Khalid were, in one place and then we have a mutual friend called Mikhail who's a Nasheed artist so he's the one that kind of brought us all together we all started chilling and we really vibed with each other we kind of Faisal Salah I grew up meeting him in different places like Rumi's Cave in London which is kind of like Tali for similar kind of space where they have events they have maulids they have spiritual gatherings they have classes etc so we all kind of knew each other but when we all got together physically and started talking to each other we realized how similar we all were and um, 
we decided to go. So the Baraka Boys thing all started. Literally, we decided to all go on a trip, a ziara to Fez. Mm. So we wanted to go check out Fez, check out some of the maqams and stuff there. Sidi Ahmed Tijani, Sidi Muhammad uh, bin Habib, for those people who were um, Shadali Darqawi. And like we went to a few Maulids, Maulai Idris. We were doing all of that on the trip. And so we organized the trip. We made a WhatsApp group. And the WhatsApp group, we called it the Baraka Boys because we were going out to get mm. Baraka. So it was it started off as a joke. We were like posting pictures and hashtagging Baraka Boys, Baraka Boys. And then it became a thing because nobody had ever seen young Muslims express themselves in that way before on Instagram, whereby we had singers, we had... So it's like, there'll be a scene of us like in the morning, we pray, go to the masjid, pray Fajr. Then we'll come back and in the morning we're having like a jam session. Faisal has the guitar out, mm. Khalid's singing, Faisal singing. Then they're playing house music at 11 a.m. Everyone's dancing, like Mohib is there dancing, like, cause he was into the techno and the house stuff. Him and Khalid were like dancing to techno music. Then Zohar went back at the Zawiya doing Ziara. And it's like, people are like, yo, like, what is going on? Like they're Muslim, they're spiritual, but they're having fun, but they're cool. Like they didn't really understand what was happening. And so people just kept on following everything from there. And during that trip, we kept on having really, really deep conversations about just our context of being young, being Western, but also having a tradition, but also, you know, party and having fun experiences that we've all lived through and kind of putting that all together. And Khalid was like, I'm sure there are hundreds or if not thousands of other young people who think and experience life in the same way that we do, but we don't really have a voice. I don't know, in the in America, it's probably different, but in the UK, the only people that we have young people representing Islam is like all these crazy Dawa people that like <laughs> go to the park and like argue with people and, you know, just insult people. And it's a very kind of aggressive and... Um, yeah, negative. I would say it's a very negative representation of Muslim youth and they come from a very frustrated place and it's it's really nasty. And so a lot of young people feel like either you have to not practice at all or you have to practice like that and nobody wants to practice like that. So when we put out the Baraka Boys, it was literally just us having the conversations that we always have about issues that we all face and putting it out there for people who might relate. And alhamdulillah, thousands of people relate. Like I'd, I've done about three US tours this year and I've spoken in over, I think it's up to 20 places now across the US and everywhere I go, there's not a time when I finish my talk that someone doesn't come up to me and be like, we love the podcast or we watch the podcast mm. or this episode, da, da, da. So it just shows the reach of it and how many young people relate to it, alhamdulillah. It's been it's been amazing. It's been an amazing journey, and I just feel like I've been watching it. Yeah, like I don't really feel like I'm doing it. I just feel like I'm watching a movie and just seeing everything happen in front of me. Yeah, it's it's really interesting. Yeah. I mean, it's a live movie, right, on Instagram. Everybody's watching. Yeah, every everybody's watching. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, that's it's fascinating that we can do that. We can just show people where we are and how do you tell your story. I want to ask you about identity because this is something I think about a lot. Mm. Uh, you know the hadith of the Prophet that said he, where he said uh, every 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 person is born on the fitra, mm -hmm. but then they're turned into a Christian or a Magian. Um, and then I think about finishing the sentence or a Muslim. Mm. Have you thought about that? Yeah. You know, and 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 a particular kind of Muslim. A particular, yeah, yeah. Because it the is. idea of um, uh, Muslim being a state of being rather than an, an identity, identity, right? Yeah. I mean, that's that's the whole point of the, the name of this podcast, American Submitter. Mm. You're submitting. That's what makes you who you are. Mm -hmm. The Muslim identity stuff, I mean, it's people are going to keep fighting about what that means. I think what's refreshing about what you guys are doing is you're just not, you're just being. You're not addressing that so much. Mm -hmm. And there's diversity in your group. Some people will play music. Some people want to do traditional studies. And mm -hmm. we all just kick it, right? Yeah. Because I think the focus is, I mean, Allah said in the Quran already, if he wanted everyone to be believers and one nation and be similar to each other, he would have done so. But he made everybody different for a reason. And he manifests all of his names and his attributes throughout the creation, 
through the differences that we all have. And it's so interesting what you're saying about human nature and the fitra and then that being at odds with an identity because in the time of the Prophet ﷺ, obviously they were just doing what the Prophet ﷺ was telling them to do. They hadn't created all these different categories of being Sufi or being Shia or being Shafi'i or being Ashari or being, you know, Tijani or Shadili or Qadri or that all kind of developed later. And I understand the Shuyukh say all of these sciences were a reality in the prime time of the Prophet ﷺ that became names and now their names without any realities Mm -hmm. in terms of tasawwuf existed in the time of the Prophet ﷺ, but it wasn't called tasawwuf. Fiqh existed in the time of the Prophet ﷺ, but it wasn't called fiqh. All of these things existed in the time of the Prophet ﷺ as lived realities, and then people tried to capture those realities and turn them into sciences in order to replicate them and make them relevant. But then that ended up in people being given identities based on these different sciences and different developments, which um, it can be discouraging. But then at the same time, I feel like if you just go back to the tradition and go back to the Quran itself, you see that the entire reason why Allah brought us into creation, this is something my shuk always kind of emphasizes, that Allah made us to be his khulafa, his representatives on the earth. He said, Inni jailan fil ardi khalifa. I'm sending somebody to represent me in the earth. And so when he created Adam and placed him here, and Adam's children and grandchildren strayed from that path of manifesting their fitrah and representing Allah in the creation, that's when the prophets were sent and the awliya were sent to bring them back to that. So the objective is khilafa, And Islam and Iman and Ihsan, they're all tools to bring you back to that reality of being a Khalifa of Allah and bringing a Abdullah. Because Allah describes all of these people in the Quran as Muslims. He describes Adam as a Muslim and Nuh as a Muslim and Ibrahim as a Muslim and Yusuf as a Muslim and Musa as a Muslim and Isa as a Muslim and Sayyidina Muhammad as a Muslim. But they all had completely different manifestations of how they were Muslim. Mm -hmm. And different Sharia's. And different Sharia's. The essence was the same but the manifestation was different. And so when you come to a time where we have uh, Khatim and Nabi or Imam Muslim Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu sent to seal the legacy of prophethood and open the door of wilaya, we can see all of these different manifestations appear within his ummah. And I feel like the differences and all of these things and all these different identities if you take them away from their essence, then they can be veils for you. But if you understand that they're just tools to bring you back to that original goal of accessing your fitra and manifesting it and becoming the Khalifa of Allah in the creation, then it can't be anything except positive. It's just about making sure you don't get limited by them or they don't become veils to you for your mission. So you don't compa- you don't care more about minute fiqh details than arriving in the presence of Allah and kind of connecting with that. Mm. And do you worry about creating an identity that will become another veil with with the culture that you guys are a part of and creating? I don't worry about it just because it's something I can't control. And I have this attitude towards life where I try not to care about things that I can't control. Because if not, I'll just be upset and worried and like suffering from panic attacks and anxiety attacks over something that I can't really change. I think all we have is our intentions and our efforts. So yeah, I make the intention to not kind of do that. But you got like even the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi even Sayyidina Isa, you know, he came as a prophet and then people turned him into a God and they turned him into all these different kind of things. It wasn't his intention and it wasn't his 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 goal. It was just a byproduct of what happened. But you can't really control it. If that's what happens, that's what happens. As long as you're not the one that's doing it, then I think it's all good, inshallah. Yeah. And how do you check your intentions? How do you work on that? What's the... I think it's simple, man. I feel like we like to kind of overcomplicate <laughs> things. 
and will be like, how do I know? Like, you know, if you know you're doing something for Allah or you're doing something for yourself, you know, within your heart, within yourself, like you lie down on your pillow and you're like, okay, did that feel good? Like I did that for the clout. Like, oh, I did that for the picture on Instagram. Or I did, or did you do it for Allah? You know, you, you, you'll be able to know yourself. Everyone is, you know, faqih nafs, like they all understand themselves and they know themselves and they know when they're doing stuff they should be doing and they know when they're doing stuff that they shouldn't be doing so the most important thing is to just do what you can to the best of your ability where you should and when you mess up and you don't do what you should be doing just make tawbah and continue the journey <laughs> man i appreciate that a lot because uh, i have a tendency to over intellectualize just about everything yeah <laughs> that's one thing i've noticed people in california do that a lot <laughs> <laughs> yeah i see that a lot and i'm just like it's really not that deep just yeah you, we know like it's simple man <laughs> how but how do you create culture mustafa how do you do it you just do it right you just do it <laughs> <isn't> it? Like, <laughs> you, you buy, just do you what buy you like a shirt you like you, you, i feel you like you say what you want to say exactly i feel like it's just about being comfortable enough with yourself to share yourself with the world yeah that's all that culture is like i'm very comfortable with all the different identities i have being british being muslim being african being gambian being nigerian being senegalese being everything and so i take what i like from each of those and i mix it together and that's mustafa briggs and then if people vibe with it they vibe with it but culture is just about self-expression mm. and self-expression is just about what you're happy with and what you feel comfortable with right? right so as long as it's obviously if you're muslim and you have your sharia guidelines then you keep everything halal to well, the best of your ability there's also some things that make you uncomfortable which are the reactions that you have beyond bilal is one of the um something that you created mm -hmm. which was a reaction to something that you felt was missing in the culture wouldn't you say yeah definitely can, can you tell us about what that is and how it came to be okay so beyond bilal is a presentation that alhamdulillah i've been doing for the past year and it's essentially summarizes the link between black history and islam so black history within islam and the effect that islam has had on black history and why I felt that was important was because we live in an age of identity politics and social justice and everyone's, you know, on Twitter being social justice warriors. And so there was a time about two years ago when everyone was talking about anti-blackness and especially or specifically anti-blackness in the Muslim community. And I saw loads of videos being made about black Muslims sharing their experiences within the Muslim community and they were complaining about, you know, being discriminated against, feeling outcasted and all of these things. And I feel like that's something I've never personally felt just because I've always had African shiuk from the beginning and I've seen African representations of Islam. And so even if people do attempt to kind of marginalize my experience or make it seem as if Africans are this way or that way. I know the reality of the situation, so it never really bothered me. Like I never had to go to an Arab masjid or an Asian masjid to be abused because I didn't need to receive Islam in those places. Like I had Islam where I was. Um, and so I was invited to a few panel sessions and I was just seeing people constantly complaining Everyone was like, yeah, you know, I went to the masjid and they asked me to give the adhan because I'm black and they and, and Bilal was black and da-da-da. Or I tried to marry this girl and her dad said no because I'm black and, you know, black people this black. And I was just like, okay, we've done the analysis of the symptoms. Now, how are you going to cure the situation? Mm. Because complaining about it is not curing it. Complaining about it creates awareness but the awareness is meant to be turned into an action. And so for me, my analysis of the situation was that people have these kind of prejudices and these ways of thinking about black Muslims just because they don't understand them and they don't know anything about them. All they know maybe is stereotypes that they've received through you know, media, through different avenues I said so it's up to us to educate people about our experience the same way everybody else educates everybody else about their own experiences so I created Beyond Bilal Black History in Islam and it deals with five subjects um, the first subject is Black History in the Quran 
So going through the traditions and realizing which prophets in the Quran and significant figures in the Quran were described as being black, either by the Quran itself or by a hadith or by tafsir, etc., to kind of give a context that the Quran is a very multicultural book and representative book. Rudolf Ware, Professor Rudolf Ware, Bill Ware, um, when I did the presentation with him in University of Santa Barbara, he opened it with a segment on ancient Egypt and the Quran. Hmm. And he highlighted the fact that over 50% of the stories in the Quran take place in Africa, more specifically around the kingdoms of ancient Egypt and Ethiopia at a time where those were the superpowers of Africa. And even the stories that don't have African, even the stories that are not taking place in Africa have African characters represented in them. So you have Queen of Sheba coming from Ethiopia to visit Suleiman. You have uh, Hajar coming from ancient Egypt to found Mecca with her son. And so, you know, it just gives you a different context into how you look at the Quranic narrative and then going into black Sahaba beyond Bilal because Bilal is always, I feel, used as the token of, okay, well, you know, there's no racism in Islam. Bilal was a slave and he was black and mm. he gave the Adhan. And the narrative doesn't really go beyond that when there are you know, hundreds of black Sahaba who played significant roles in the Ummah of the Prophet Sallallahu alongside people like Suhaib al-Rumi from Rome and Salman al-Farsi. And you know, it was a very multicultural society, similar to the multicultural society we have today, but people don't really represent that. Then I talk about the spread of Islam in West Africa because most Muslims, black Muslims are West African, either recently or anciently, like the African-Americans come from West Africa essentially. So all of that. And then I talk about um, the international relations of Sheikh Ibrahim Yas as a representation of the effect that African Islam or the tradition of Islam in Africa has had on global politics in the Muslim world. So I talk about his relationship with, you know, Gamal Abdel Nasser, King Hassan II, Kwame Nkrumah in Ghana, all of the political leaders of his time um, being received by Chairman Mao and Zhao Enlai in communist China, being the vice president of the Muslim World Congress in Karachi, Pakistan, and everything he learned that took him to that level, he learned in a mud hut in Senegal. So I talk about that and then I finish it with um, female scholarship in the West African Muslim tradition. And I talk about the female shuyukh that are there and, you know, the underrepresentation of female scholars within Islam generally, and then the understudy of female scholarship in West Africa specifically. Um, and so just to bring people to a different understanding and a different perception of black Muslims and Islam in the West, it was more for black Muslims themselves to and to know themselves and know that they have a place within the Islamic narrative. And then also for people who wanted to know what and understand the history of, you know, the black Muslim narrative. That was mm -hmm. essentially what it was because I was tired of, you know, the narrative that I was seeing and I wanted to contribute to a change. And so that's mm -hmm. why I brought Pion Bella out. Alhamdulillah, it's been, it's been received really well so far. Alhamdulillah. Yeah. It seems like you tapped into a zeitgeist. Mm. You know, like a lot of people are responding to this. You've taken this all around the place. Yeah, like, I'm doing that. Tons of Harvard and mm. others, other places, yeah. SOAS. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, tell me some of the reactions that people have had. What, what does this do for people, understanding this research and this narrative that you've uncovered? For so many people, I feel like they it's a paradigm shift for them because they're like, we never knew that this existed and it existed right under our noses in the sense that when the first two sections about the black figures in the Quran and the black Sahaba beyond Bilal, these are all things that are there in the books that everybody studies or everybody has access to, but they didn't see it before or they didn't look at it in that way. And then, or they weren't taught it. So they have imams and scholars who have studied all these books, but they just failed to mention or failed to put emphasis on it. And I feel like it's um, it feeds into the scholarship and the traditional scholarship that you have in your community and your environment contributes to what you feel Islam is about. Mm. So like, I feel like in West Africa, for example, all of my shiuch, for them, and the vibe we get in West Africa is Islam is about knowing God and having a relationship with him and being good to people 
and feeding people and then there's not emphasis placed on other areas so like for example you can go to senegal and you can see women who don't wear hijab but they pray five times a day and no one really says anything to them or you see shuyukh that like they receive people that come to visit them and singers will go and visit them and like cultural icons will come and visit them and all of these things that I can't really see happening in the West just because for us, we were brought up to be told that Islam is about following rules and Islam is about your identity and Islam is about you have to have a beard and a hijab and look a certain way because we live in a context where, you know, we're under threat and there's Islamophobia and you need to represent the Sunnah. And for, for us in the West, a lot of the narrative I saw growing up was Sunnah is the beard, Sunnah is the leather socks, Sunnah is making sure your hijab is on tight and you can't see any of your hairs and if not you're a terrible muslim whereas in other places islam is feeding people islam is building mosques islam is building schools islam is teaching people to have a relationship with allah and knowing that allah exists and he's a part of your life and he's closer to you than your jugular vein and so the scholarship is what places emphasis on certain things above others so like the bay area alhamdulillah the scholarship here focuses on having it knowing and understanding the intellectual legacy of the umman knowing and understanding the spiritual legacy and kind of manifesting that in your day-to-day life which i feel like is very important and so what was even the original question i think like i digress <laughs> well I mean, I, beyond yeah. Bilal, what was the reaction to yeah, it? What's the, yeah, uh, so the reaction to it, I feel like people were just um, happy to know and understand. So uh, black Muslims were happy to know and understand that this history was there and they didn't even know about it. And so for them, it was a source of like pride where they could connect to this and kind of see it, see themselves in Islam mm-hmm. after years of being told f- that or being told directly and indirectly that Islam is an Arab religion or a Desi religion or not a religion for them. And then also it gave insight because most of the people that have come to my talks have not been black. I would say about only 30% of the people that come to my talks have been black. Mm -hmm. The majority have been non-black people who just wanted to understand this side of the narrative and understand the history. And they were really open to it. Like I haven't had I think in all of the places I've done it, I've done it in over 40 places. Um, and over like six, five to six countries, I did it in the UK, I did it in Canada, I did it in Jamaica, I did it in Puerto Rico, I've done it in the USA, I've done it in Nigeria. And I've only had, I think, about three negative reviews mm. out of thousands of people that have come to see it. And yeah, the one negative review was about my timekeeping. <laughs> <laughs> the other one was about... Um, how I represented Kamal Abdel Nasser in one, in one uh, presentation. And then the other one was about, yeah, like why does Sheikh Ibrahim have all these relationship with all these political figures who are uh, blah, blah, blah. But other than that, it's been well received. It's been really, really good. And I feel like it was something that people need because I never actually advertised it in a way where I like I never approached any institutions or any universities to host me. I literally just put the poster on my Instagram and my Facebook and I'm like, if anyone wants to book me, just email me. And the email started coming in and I was responding to them. Um, so it's something that, yeah, people have requested from me in a sense, like everywhere I've gone, people have requested me to come there and I haven't kind of been trying to be out there like, yo, beyond Bilal, let me bring it to your university. So it just shows that I feel like this is something Muslims want to know about and they want to discover and they want to hear about. Yeah, one of the one of the critiques you hear a lot about traditional Islam is that it fails to be relevant to the the, the time that we live in. Mm. So your presentation strikes me to be a type of modern scholarship and you're using these modern tools Mm. to do it. You're not writing a book in Arabic that nobody's going to read. Mm. <laughs> You're presenting it with <laughs> pictures and graphic design. And so that part is interesting to me. But the word you use emphasis, I think that's that's an interesting word because a lot of times it's like it's either this or it's that. But to say, what are we emphasizing? Exactly. Let's emphasize what we need right now. 
Let's not focus on the things that may not be helpful. It's an attitude rather than a, a paradigm or an epistemology or something like that. Hundred percent. Because I feel like Islam is so vast. When you study, you realize that Islam and the Islamic tradition and the scholars, they've had things to say about everything. So there was a time when you have scholars that talk about reinterpreting Greek philosophy for the Muslim context. So you have like Plato's Republic being translated into Arabic. And then I think it's Ibn Sina or I forgot who it was, but they wrote like a Muslim version essentially of Plato's Republic. And so the emphasis for that scholar was reviving the tradition of the ancient Greek philosophers who he saw as and who the world saw as you know, the leading intellectuals in history up until that point and placing it in an Islamic context for Muslims to be able to understand. Then in other societies, you have emphasis on um, social justice. Yeah, in other societies, you have emphasis on war. In other societies, you have emphasis on spirituality and spiritual practices. Like when the Abbasid Khilafah was becoming very extravagant, you had Shiyu talking about, let's emphasize Zuhud. Let's emphasize abstinence from the world. Let's emphasize whatever. So I feel like all of these different scholars, we have a thousand four hundred years of tradition dealing with everything. So what are the issues that are happening in our society and what do we need to place emphasis on? That's what it is. Because I feel like the past kind of hundred, two hundred years, because of colonization and because of imperialism and because of Western globalized culture, people have felt attacked in their identity as Muslims, as Arabs, as because I mean, like, for example, if you look at the Arab world, most of the countries that exist in the Arab world didn't exist 100 years ago. Lebanon, Jordan, Syria, Palestine were not countries. It was just all one region. When the British came in and all the politics started happening and the creation of Israel, and then you start to see, like, the pan-Arab movement rise and everyone's establishing um republics and all of these things that's when people now start to look for identities and they're like, okay well you know the west is imposing their identity we need to find an identity quick we're muslim let's focus on and place emphasis on the fact that this is a woman's aura we'll create an identity out of that and create hijab culture and make being a hijabi your sole purpose as a muslim woman or being a bearded Muslim and physically showing that you are Muslim and you have these political sentiments and you had these political, you know, ways of thinking, that's what Islam is about. And so that's what we're brought up being told Islam is about because of the emphasis placed on those things. Whereas in other places where you don't have that, so like, for example, I keep going back to Senegal as a reference, the identity politics wasn't based around being Muslim. It was based around your Africanness. So are you going to be African or you're going to be European? So that Islam wasn't really affected to that way where they felt like they had to create Muslim identities to fight back against colonialization. It was more about being rooted in your African identity and Islam was a part of that. So you see the way Islam is manifest there is different from how it's manifest in other places. Mm. All of these things, it's all reactionary. So it's reaction to the time, reaction to the politics, reaction to, as you said, the zeitgeist of what's going on in your context. And so I feel like it's up to us as young people who live in this new world and live with this new technology and live within this globalized monoculture and live within these societies to think about what aspects of the Islamic tradition are the most relevant to our context today? And what do we need to connect to? Because there's this, this whole concept of being connected to the tradition, but what part of the tradition? Are you connected to the intellectual aspect of the tradition, the philosophical aspect of the tradition? Mm. Are you all about inheritance laws? Like you could have a movement tomorrow that starts where they start talking about, well, the American inheritance system is unjust and in islam we have an inheritance system of our own let's campaign for inheritance laws in the quran to be established in the community and that could become a whole movement do you know what i mean and people place their whole identity on the fact that when i die i want the right 
to have my children inherit according to the Sharia <laughs> and not according to. Do you know what I mean? It's yeah, like yeah. whatever you emphasize, that's what that's what gets spoken about. Right, right, right. So creating, a, <laughs> you can create an identity around any of these things. Around any of these things. <clears throat> so I feel like yeah, this is just, something I've been thinking about. So I want to try this out on you, which is. Is there a broader identity that Islam attaches us to, which is being part of Bani Adam, which is about being, um, you know, that we were standing on the plains of Arafah and Allah asks, asks us, am I not your Lord? And we say, Bala, Shahidna. That's, that's your identity. That's your metaphysical identity. Um, but of course, there are these I mean, the way I see it, you know, we've, the whole world has been uprooted, right? In the last 500 years, colonialism, nationalism, s the slave, uh, slavery, uh, enslavement of peoples and taking, destroying people's language, destroying people's culture. And we're all, every single person has experienced it. It's not just um, on some level. I mean, let's say if you're a white person, do you know your lineage? Do you know your mm. heritage? You know, it's same with somebody who was taken out of the Gambia and, mm. and put onto a boat and, and brought here. Um, so that's America. It's all between whites and blacks. And here I am, a brown person, came here. My father came here for economic opportunity. Mm. And uh, as as non-black or white people, you have to sort of choose an identity. Are you going to become identified with the blacks? Are you going to identify with the whites? Usually it has to do with class and where you go to school. Mm. And um, so we're all trying to make it make sense of it. And uh, of course, nine eleven happens when I'm eighteen, mm. and oh, then wow. and then it's a it's a major like okay, you are Muslim, you can't escape it. Mm. You can't escape it. You know, I thought maybe I could convert to whiteness. Uh, <laughs> I was a white convert. <laughs> People never think about that, but there's a lot of those. Yeah, of course. Um, wow, yeah, that's really deep. You need know, to get some fair and lovely, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, so the identity. I actually think sometimes, sometimes I see some of my white brothers and sisters, people that would be identified as white. They're attracted to that that aspect of Islam that, like, oh, I can just erase this history. Mm. And my association with this history, I can just, I'm just B Bunny Adam. Mm. So that's problematic in its own way. Mm -hmm. But then there's also the thing of, um, like, I'm this kind of Muslim or I'm that kind of Muslim. Uh, and then there's also, the, I, I spoke with a, an academic who studied uh, student travelers in the 90s. She went and did an ethnography of, of, uh, of Americans that went to Syria and Yemen and Egypt in, in the 90s to study. And now those are people who are, a lot of them are teachers. Mm -hmm. And she said, she one of her uh, comments is that it's a trope that there's some type of lost or stolen knowledge. And I went and I successfully have gotten it and I have it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> which I thought was really and I'm the gatekeeper of this knowledge in yeah, the West. which is very interesting, right? So I think it's insightful. I think it's insightful. But there is, but then there is some. There is a narrative that is true. There was something lost. There was something stolen. Wasn't? I there? mean, we didn't have access to that knowledge. If you look at like the history of, for example, the formation of the nation of Islam, right? Or even like my father-in-law, his 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 father was one of the key founding members of a movement called Darul Islam, which was a Sunni. Um, African American movement that produced like the likes of Imam Jamil Al Amin, all of these people, and they existed before the Nation of Islam or around the same time. And he was telling me like when his father took Shahada, when his father converted to Islam, it was because he was one of the first um, black students in the University of California, I believe, and he had access to the library, he had access to books, he started, and there was like you know in those days there's no internet, there's no it's expensive to travel. If you travel, who do you know in these other countries to access this information? So literally he saw an encyclopedia of the world and he was reading about Africa and he saw about the ancient African kingdoms, Muslim kingdoms in Northern Nigeria, uh, Sokoto and Osman Danfodio, et cetera. And that inspired him to look into Islam. And then he read a few books on Islam and he was like, okay, well, I'm Muslim. At that time, they have one Ahmadi English translation of the Quran, which is the 
translation of the Quran that the nation of Islam used to use. And that's all they had. They had maybe one Faza'il Amal book from the Tabalik Jama'at. They had one other book. There's like five books in total that people are taking their whole deen from. And so when you see people now coming into an era where airfare is cheaper, you can make connections to scholars in Morocco, you can make connections to scholars in Syria, in Pakistan, in all of these places, people start to fly out to get that access. So the Darul Islam, it split and it became one movement called the Fuqara because there was a sheikh from, a peer from Pakistan called Mubarak Ali Jailani. And he came to the community and he was like, okay, well, you guys don't really know much about Islam. Let me teach you. And he started teaching them. He introduced them to Tasawwuf. He gave them the Qadri Tariqah. And so like my, my wife's family, they're all Qadri and they all have a peer in Pakistan and they would, used to go to Pakistan to study oh. because that's where they had the connection and that's where they found more of what they were looking for mm. because that's what they had access to at the time. So I feel like, okay, maybe in 2019, it might be a bit of a trope to say, I went to this place and I received this sacred knowledge that no one had. But in America, in the 80s, 70s, there wasn't that connection and there wasn't that access. So people needed to go and study and bring it back, at least to provide a bit more access to the tradition than was already available. Mm -hmm. Because like Nation of Islam, when you read um, Muhammad, when you read Malcolm X's biography, it's like, okay, the NOI, they had like a translation of the Quran. The Quran, there's nowhere in the Quran that teaches you how to pray. You need to go to the Sunnah, you need to go to a fiqh manual for that information, right? So when you see the scenes where Ma Malcolm X is talking about the, the prayer that they used to do and they'll recite the Fatiha in English and, you know, they'll face the East and all of that, they're piecing that together from the two or three books that they have access to in the English language. They don't even know Arabic. They can't access the tradition. And then when you see later on Imam Warith Deen may then make the switch and all of that, that's because they had access to more information. Mm -hmm. So I feel like, yeah, that is... There is something that was lost, but I wouldn't say it's lost in the sense that it's a tradition that was still living in all of these places. But with us in the West, we were disconnected from that. So all of us, no matter where we are in any time, we're piecing something together. Of course, 100%. So where are you in this journey right now? Chilling, man. <laughs> with you <laughs> yeah. on the podcast. I take every day as it comes. <laughs> I see that. I see that. But um yeah, for me personally, yeah, piecing it together. So Because you're in you're in Egypt. And yeah, you're, yeah, yeah. You're with very you're in a very particular strain of, of teaching and knowledge. And yeah. that's what I want to hear you, yeah, yeah. you just reflect on for a bit. So for Egypt, um essentially with Azhar, obviously Azhar has this thousand year legacy of scholarship. And it's the center of the Muslim world in the sense that wherever you go or wherever you come from, Egypt and Saudi to an extent, but we all know what's been happening in Saudi recently, had been the center. So like, for example, West Africans, when they travel on Hajj, they always had to pass through Egypt. And on their way back to West Africa, they'll pass through Egypt. And so it was known as Asimutilim, the capital of knowledge because that's where people from all over the world gather on their way to and from. And so I feel like it's interesting because Islam kind of were the forerunners of globalization in the sense that establishing the Hajj and calling people from all over the world to meet in one place once a year was a chance for people to exchange ideas and go back to their communities and bring things back. So like very recently I was reading a paper about Jalaluddin Suyuti and his relationship with the West African kings of Songhai and Borno. Yeah. Because whenever they went on Hajj, they traveled with they traveled through Egypt, they stopped at Jalaluddin Suyuti's classes, they studied with him, they received Ijazat, they took his books back to Nigeria and back to, you know, Mali. And that's how that strand of knowledge had been spread there. Um, so I feel like it's not just an Egyptian <clears throat> Islam, but it's like the center of the Islamic tradition because you see scholars from everywhere going there, studying, exchanging knowledge, and then taking it back. Um, so in my going there, not only it's impossible to like study, I feel, without like a scholarship or whatever in the West, I can go to Egypt, 
I work for like three months and every, all the money I make, I take it back to Egypt. I can live for a year, study. I'm in a place where I have access to thousands of Arabic teachers, thousands of, and it's comfortable enough for my wife who'd never really left America before. She traveled with me. Like I couldn't take her to the desert in Mauritania and study. I wouldn't want to put her through that or Senegal or do you know what I mean? All of these places where I've studied as a single man, but as a family man, like Egypt has that balance of being modern enough, but also having enough of the tradition in place where I can kind of study and just understand Islam in how it's been presented. So, you know, everyone always talks about the tradition and fiqh and hadith and da da da, and you have to know all of these things before you can say something about Islam. I don't particularly, let me say this in a way that is gonna not sound like, um, Basically, what Islam has been made to be in this day and age is all based around all of these sciences. So in order for you to begin to even find your way within Islam, you need to be able to know what all this stuff is to be able to contextualize it to then move forward or do what you need to do. Because in order to understand the Quran now, you have to understand tafsir, you have to understand hadith, you have to understand the history of how the Quran was compiled, how it was interpreted, it, who interpreted it, what were their traditions, where did they live, how did they conceptualize it, how is that different from where you live and how you conceptualize it, what bits do you take, what bits do you leave behind, how do you know the difference between what to take and what to leave behind because you don't know which part of it comes from Allah, comes from the Prophet or comes from somebody's interpretation mm -hmm. so like i remember for example there was one ramadan i was on the way to the mosque with a friend of mine so i'm west african like my teachers are maliki he's east african his teachers are shafi but we don't know the difference between shafi and maliki we just know oh my teacher said this your teacher said that so teenage boy in london i saw a girl that i know on the way to tarawe and she saw me and she was like, oh my God, Briggs. She came up and she hugged me. So I hugged her, we were, t we were chilling, talking, whatever. We were young, we were like 16, 17. Then we get to the masjid. When we get to the masjid, I had done wudu before I left my house. So I got to the masjid and then I'm going into the, to the prayer hall. And my friend is like, yo, you need to go and do your wudu again. I was like, I didn't break my wudu. He's like, you did, you touched that girl, you hugged her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because... He's been told, the emphasis has been put in the Shafi Madhab, touching a woman breaks your wudu, regardless of the situation. Mm -hmm. For Maliki's is context. If you touch with shahwa, it breaks your wudu without... Shahwa is pleasure. Yeah, pleasure, yeah. If you receive pleasure from it. And it was just a hug. It wasn't like whatever. Whether or not that was halal or haram, that's a whole different debate. But in terms of my wudu, for mm -hmm. me, what I knew from my teachers was this. So how do you then know what comes from the prophet and what is actually what does you know they say islam says right <laughs> what does islam say about this right, situation right. how do you judge if you don't know the historical context as to how those scholars brought those different opinions and then the history of how him as an east african became shafi and me as a west african became mm. maliki you won't know where to go you're like okay what well, is this haram is this not is this okay is this not mm. so i feel like yeah i just wanted to access the tradition to be able to get like a holistic view well, and the, then know where to go from there so that's what you're doing right now yeah so a lot of times i see that when we when we study these books it's removed from the history mm. we don't think about the history at all even probably the way they teach it yeah, where, yeah, where yeah. you're learning are you piecing this together yourself? yeah I'm, i have a very historical mind Mm. like I'm all about history that's my favorite subject really? so when like they say for example Imam Shafi said for a lot of people it would just be oh okay Imam Shafi he's a sheikh he said for me it will be okay who's Imam Shafi what era did he live in who were his teachers what's his tradition how did he get to where he is what part of the world did he live in how does that affect his worldview how did it reach us in Cairo where we are today or if you're in Zaytuna how did it reach California how why are we choosing to study Imam Shafi and not Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal those are the kind of questions that I think about so I piece things together so I always like to put things in a historical context just because you'll never fully understand it if you don't understand it in its context yeah, and you'll never be able to take that and apply it to your context right 
right? That's really important. Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. Because even Imam Shafi, the whole reason he has his own madhab is because he didn't agree with his teacher, Imam Malik, on certain issues. Right. And the approach that they had, or the approach of the Maliki school is completely different from the approach of the Hanafi school because what was going on in Medina was different from what was happening in Kufa. Like all of these things, if you don't understand the history behind it, then they're just differences that will confuse you because you don't know why everything is different when the pamphlet Islam that you read says Islam says right. the one thing. But for now, you're Maliki. <laughs> <laughs> Attached to the Tijani Tariqa. There is a particular that you're attached to. Which yeah, is, yeah. I mean, which for is now, important, right? It's, you okay. have to have something that works. You have to have something that works, but I feel like you shouldn't let yourself be boxed in, if that makes sense. So, like, Sheikh Ibrahim Yas has a saying, because, you know, Sheikh Ibrahim, he was Maliki, he was Ashari, he was Tijani, Sufi, but he was the vice president of the Muslim World League with people like. Ibn Uthaymin and Bin Baz. And then he was a member of the Scholars Council in Azhar, talking to Gamal Abdel Nasser. Then he was in Morocco. Then he was in Pakistan with Maulana Maududi and all of these people. So it's like, for him, he said, I'm only Tijani when I'm holding my tasbih doing my weird. Other than that, I'm just a Muslim amongst the Muslims. Like, all these identities and all these different strains, I feel like instead of you seeing yourself being put into different boxes you should just see yourself as like a well that has different streams of water flowing into it from different places so i have my influence from in fiqh from the school of imam malik then i have my influence into Sawa from sidi ahmed tijani sheikh ibrahim then i have my cultural influences from being born in inner city london then i have and all of that just makes up me as a person and then even all of that, it's just my jazz, like it's just allegory. Because in reality, I'm not even any of these things. I'm, you know, I was that soul that said, Bala, <laughs> before I came into this world. And I'm going to return to a state where there will be no family ties and there will be no identities and there will be no politics and there will be no pronouns and there will be nothing except were you good did you believe and did you make the best of that part of a day that you were in this world and i feel like that's what we failed to realize like as a pre-eternity and abad like post-eternity those are the real days and those are the real times because allah describes the quran in the quran like the day when your lord asked you and that's a day before the creation of the sun or the moon or quantifiable days as we know it. And then Yom Qiyama, we see a hadith where they say, you know, Yom Qiyama will be thousands and thousands of years. Those are days. Everything in between those two days, when you're brought back, Allah says, how long were you there? And you say a day or a bit of a day. It's a flash. It's an allegory. It's like so minute that I feel like we shouldn't kill ourselves <laughs> trying to figure out what box to fit ourselves in and what to do and da 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 and all of these minute details when there's the bigger picture of inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun like you belong to Allah and you're gonna return to Him, you come from Him and you're going back to Him. So just using Islam and iman and ihsan as tools to access Allah. I think is the goal in yeah. whichever avenue you use to do that. Disclaimer, as long as it's within <laughs> the bounds of the Quran and the Sunnah. <laughs> yeah. Well, this conversation was, I've enjoyed every minute of it and uh, we've gone longer than I've asked you to. So, Alhamdulillah. So Alhamdulillah. Good. Yeah, I know you got a flight to catch. Yeah. Where are you off to next? I'm back to London. Back to London. Yeah, for a month. And then I'm back to Egypt, inshallah. Inshallah, we will continue this conversation another time and see where you end up. Yeah, yeah. Let's journey. see. Let's, let's compare notes next year or something. When <laughs> I come back, see what's changed. Appreciate it, man. All right. Well, Assalamu alaikum. Right. And have uh, tawfiq on your journey. I mean, I mean, wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. <laughs>